This video is brought to you by viewers like you. Thank you. Be sure to subscribe and help get this video to 2,000 likes. And I see Arthur is rehearsing for Aunt Lucy's wedding. He says DW is so excited for the ceremony, she even married the toaster to the blender, which seems fairly progressive for 1996. Arthur's relatives are staying at the Reed house for the wedding, including the killer queen bee that is Cousin Cora. What could be worse than a giant paint bubble? Oh, I know. <laughs> Two giant paint bubbles. The Reed parents foolishly make these two alpha c**ts share the same room, and Cousin Cora immediately moves in on DW's turf. DW attempts to prevent a bloodbath by sharing her dolls with Cora, who coldly brushes them off as baby toys. Does she have a bikini? No. Does she tan? How the fuck is a doll gonna get a tan? As Flower Girl, Cora brags that she's the most important part of the ceremony. She flaunts her quote-unquote gold locket in DW's face and then yells at her when the cheap-ass clasp breaks. Cora runs crying to her pushover of a mom, claiming DW broke the locket. DW tries to defend herself while her mom doesn't do a damn thing. We're barely three minutes into the episode, and already I want to take a blowtorch to this curly-haired cretin. The awful colors hurt my eyes. Wait, was Cora's mom standing on DW? The next morning, DW complains how she doesn't get to do anything during the wedding. She sets off to find a task of her own, nearly steamrolling her brother in the process. Mr. Reed, who for some reason waited until the day of the wedding to cook the reception banquet, kicks DW out of the kitchen before she has a chance to destroy the wedding cake. DW next goes to pester her aunt and uncle, and ends up staining both their clothes. DW goes crying to her mom just as Cora shows off her flower tiara. On the drive to the wedding, DW whines about how Arthur gets to sit up front, which is honestly a valid point since Mrs. Reed is also in the car. DW says she hopes Cora gets sick so she can be the flower girl. And for once, I find myself siding with DW. Well, I'll be double dog damn. Everyone gets to the church and Cora barges in acting like she's the queen of the Nile. The bridal party is in the middle of the photo shoot when DW storms in to make it about her. Aunt Lucy, <gasps> next time you get married, can I help? What a bitch. The wedding is about to start, and DW is still foaming at the mouth. When I get married, I'll tell anybody who wants to help, they can. Trust me, I'll have plenty to say about that next time. The ceremony begins as Cora berates Arthur to the point that he catapults the ring into the organ. Arthur is too big to fit inside the organ and asks Cora to help. Cora says, fuck that, and tells them to just buy a new ring. The wedding is ruined until DW steps in and rescues the ring from inside the organ. Cora's ego takes a critical hit as DW single-handedly saves the wedding. The ceremony resumes and Arthur gladly lets DW be the ring bearer. And we never see Cousin Cora again after this episode, cause the writers probably realize that one bratty baby is enough for this show. For if the two were to ever combine their forces, they would probably end up ruling hell together. Let's review. Cousin Cora crawled her way out of Satan's abyss to show DW who the real biggest bitch of PBS is. She stole DW's bed, forcing her to sleep on the floor, and then had the gall to insult her room. She called DW a boring baby and falsely blamed her for breaking her tacky locket. Cora never shut up about being the flower girl, leading DW to pester everyone into making her part of the wedding ceremony. Cora's insults and taunts caused Arthur to have a panic attack in the middle of the procession, leading him to fling the ring into the organ. Cora refused to help get the ring back, which resulted in DW single-handedly saving the day. And anyone who makes DW look like a hero deserves a special place in hell next to Hitler and Barney the Dinosaur. F you, Cousin Cora. And I see ah, what the hell. And F you, DW. And I see Arthur is doing rabbit blackface when DW comes in to stop the show. Arthur steps in to put things back on track, and even for an opening teaser, things are getting way too meta. Arthur and DW are fighting over the remote as DW refuses to give up the last minute of her TV time. DW changes the channel to TLC and gets enamored with an ad for a show about the perfect wedding. DW asks her dad if she can have a wedding, which he naively brushes off as he knows nobody will ever want to exchange vows with his overbearing offspring. DW goes to Emily to plan the perfect wedding, even though neither of them seems to know what a wedding really is, which makes absolutely no sense seeing how DW was the ring bearer for her Aunt Lucy's wedding. Emily lets DW borrow one of her nanny's dresses, 
which looks like a marmalade sandwich threw up on a shower curtain. D.W. decides to have the ceremony at the Crosswire house, and Muffy gleefully takes on the role of wedding planner. D.W. lies and says the wedding is for D. Wu, as she's worried Arthur might selfishly ruin her sham child marriage. D.W. tells Muffy she wants a high-concept fantasy-themed wedding with unicorns and rainbows. When Muffy asks who the groom is, D.W. randomly picks James, saying she wants someone who will do anything and everything she tells him. James, you poor bastard. D.W. is on cloud nine until Muffy explains what a wedding actually is. Which again, D.W. should already know because she's already been to one. Muffy says it's too late to call off the wedding because even though she just printed out the invitations, she scheduled the ceremony for tomorrow. That night, D.W. has a nightmare about being married to James and moving in with his family. But let's be honest, we all know James is way too good for this nitwitted knee-biter. D.W. decides to not show up, until her dad ropes her in to help cater for the reception. The Tibble Tire Fires go to get James for the ceremony, who apparently wasn't even told about being the groom. Backed into a corner, D.W. finally tells Muffy the truth. D.W. gets overwhelmed by the mess she created for herself and runs off in tears, but not before her father gets stuck with the bill. Instead of getting grounded for the rest of her life, D.W. is allowed to watch TV with Emily, who she says would still make a perfect bridesmaid. Think you'll be available in about 20 years? Look, it's been a hot minute since I was 24, but even then, I thought that was still too young to get married. The last thing we need is a full-grown D.W. with a wedding ring and the power to vote. Let's review. D.W. decided to throw herself a lavishly expensive wedding despite not knowing what a wedding is. She roped in her best friend to help make her delusional fantasy a reality and conned Arthur's snobbiest friend into planning the whole ceremony. She once again dragged poor James into her schemes of romance. Not because she liked him, but because she knew he would do whatever she wanted. When D.W. found out what a wedding really is, she tried to back out until she was forced to confront the consequences of her own terrible decisions. Despite not going through with the sham marriage, D.W.'s father was still forced to pay for the entire thing, which will likely put him and the Reed family in the red for the foreseeable future. And even though D.W. tried to trick another child into marrying her and bankrupted her father's catering company, once again, D.W. goes unpunished because I guess 11 minutes isn't long enough to include the ass whipping she desperately deserves. F U D W. Arthur explains how DW never goes anywhere without her blankie, even though it's never made a single appearance in any of the 50 episodes prior to this one. DW discovers her blankie has gone missing. DW runs around the house looking for it, knocking over everything and everyone in her path. My blankie's missing! Big whoop! Fun fact, that was actually Mark Brown's original title for this story. Arthur nearly manages to escape before D.W. strong arms him into helping her find her blankie. D.W.'s first instinct is to blame the dog, because I guess D.W. hates animals. Go figure. D.W. threatens Arthur that if he doesn't help her find the blankie, she'll tell all his friends he sleeps with a teddy bear, which according to every 90s kids show is the most emasculating thing you can do, aside from getting kissed by your grandma and accidentally walking into the girl's bathroom. D.W. remembers last having her blankie when she and her mom went to visit the Tibble Twat Waffles. D.W. reasons the dastardly dipshits must have pulled a total Tibble recall by stealing her blankie and then wiping her memory. They go to visit Grandma Tibble, only to learn the dimwitted duo are out of town. Not only that, but Arthur gets suckered into babysitting the terrifying twosome as soon as they get back. D.W. next drags Arthur to the dry cleaners, where she believes the machine hypnotized her into handing over her blankie. She goes to the store, only to get laughed at by the manager. Such a cute little girl! Woody, 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 woody. Hey lady, stop tickling other people's children. D.W. then tries the library, where Arthur accidentally runs into Binky. Oh no, it's Arthur. I don't want him to know I'm reading books. <laughs> The two next try the car wash, as D.W. believes her blankie got sucked up by the vacuum after she stupidly left the window rolled down. When that theory goes tits up, D.W. makes one last-ditch effort to find her blankie by checking the sugar bowl. Arthur is worried D.W. will embarrass him in front of the girls inside. But honestly, Arthur, who the hell are you trying to impress? Arthur manages to get D.W. out of the shop, but not before screwing things up in the most introverted way possible. What's her favorite flavor? I... chocolate... Vanilla chip blankie. Smooth. 
Fed up with D.W.'s wild goose chase, Arthur decides to ditch his sister to watch movies with Buster, only to find out Buster's mom already returned the movie to the video store. Don't you hate when that happens? That night, D.W. says she can't go to bed without her blankie. Mr. Reed, who was apparently fine with his 8-year-old and 4-year-old going all over town by themselves, tells D.W. to shut up and go to sleep. Arthur offers to share his stuffed bear Stanley to help D.W. fall asleep. D.W. tells him to fuck off. Just then... Pal comes in with D.W.'s blankie in tow. D.W. says it can't be hers since it doesn't smell like four years' worth of farts and snot. Turns out, Mrs. Reed washed the blankie earlier that morning, which is something she definitely could have told D.W. before she left for work. Arthur goes back to bed, only to realize he left Stanley in D.W.'s room. D.W. comes back to tease Arthur that she plans to keep the bear forever, leading Arthur to beat D.W.'s sorry ass into oblivion. Let's review. D.W. lost her goddamn mind over a glorified snot rag. She blackmailed her brother into helping her and dragged him all over town trying to find the damned thing. She accused everybody she knew of taking her blankie and indirectly caused Arthur to embarrass himself in front of his friends. She caused Arthur to miss his movie day with Buster and accidentally roped him in into babysitting the Tibble Taints. D.W. refused to go to bed without her blankie and coldly brushed off Arthur's attempt to help her go to sleep. It turned out D.W. failed to realize the blankie was in her room the whole time, because it only took her parents four years before they decided to clean D.W.'s gross-ass security blanket, which is probably host to God knows how many infectious diseases. And even after Arthur helped find her blankie, D.W. stole his teddy bear and refused to give it back. But the main takeaway from this episode is that when something of yours goes missing, you shouldn't rush to accuse everyone of stealing it. Because as the saying goes, when you start pointing fingers at others, you've got at least one middle finger pointing right back at you. F-U-D-W. D.W. takes over the show to tell everyone just how awful Arthur is, like how he selfishly demands privacy and has the utter gall to be slightly overweight. I'm a pasty. D.W. goes to the Tibble tryhards for advice on how to deal with her brother. The diabolical duo tell her to hypnotize him into being her personal slave. They also suggest she should wait until he becomes a famous pianist and then ruin his concert by showing up late and eating loud snacks, which seems way too evil even for D.W. standards. D.W. shoots down their terrible ideas, calling them both goopy heads. The Tibble turds gaslight D.W. into thinking she's the greatest insult comic on two legs. D.W. tries out her weak-ass insults on her brother, only to get decimated by the level 20 Roastmaster. You're not the boss of me, Mr. Goopy. D.W., please move your big, enormous, large, gopher-looking head. Damn! At least my head doesn't look like a football with glasses. No, your head looks like a big meatloaf with raisins. Holy shit! The Reed parents are about to leave for date night when D.W. comes in crying about her epic failure. The Reed parents ignore this hilarious insult and leave babysitter Catherine to sort out D.W.'s hissy fit. Arthur and D.W. continue to exchange insults throughout the night, which ends up devolving to the point of the two just shouting the thesaurus at each other. D.W. nearly gets the better of Arthur until he pulls a 619 by turning D.W.'s own name into an insult. You're such a... Dora Winifred! Catherine does what she should have done in the first place and sends the two to bed. That night... D.W. has a dream where she gets verbally attacked by Arthur the Grand Wizard. Wait, nope, can't call him that. D.W.'s dear friend Walter tells her she can only defeat her brother with the help of the Great Thesaurus. D.W. uses dream logic to get to the Thesaurus's castle. You didn't want to watch me walk through the woods, did you? That would be so boring. No, but we definitely wanted to watch you blow your nose for 15 seconds. Turns out, the Tibble Tightwads were turned to stone by evil Arthur's literal insult hurling. Miss Turner guides D.W. through the castle, passing by several cost-saving stock footage files along the way. D.W. meets with the Great Thesaurus, who gives her the perfect insult for Arthur. D.W. goes to use the insult on her brother, which ends up killing him. Ah! D.W. rightfully shits her pants right when her parents wake her up. D.W. apologizes to her brother, and the two make up, as D.W. is glad her nightmare is finally over. Or is it? Let's review. D.W. foolishly tried to step to Arthur's game and was rightfully put in her place, 
She tried using a lot of big words to one-up her brother, only to get utterly decimated when he used her own name against her. The only way for DW to beat Arthur was in her dreams, where she ended up killing him. And even after DW learned her lesson and apologized to Arthur, it turns out that none of it even happened. Because Arthur roasted her so hard, he ended up trapping her in an endless nightmare that she hopefully never wakes up from. F-U-D-W. Arthur and Buster are playing catch outside, because it's 2006 and the only thing worth watching on YouTube at the time was this. Mr. Reed is horrified to find a chip in the cake plate he bought for a wedding gig. They specifically requested this one. And they put the caterer in charge of ordering it? Seems more like something the wedding planner would be responsible for. But whatever. We gotta have an episode, I guess. D.W. comes in and the first words out of her mouth is, she didn't do it. A well-worn tune she'll be singing the rest of her life. Arthur says he's been outside all day when D.W. chimes in like the free-range blabbermouth she is. Turns out, D.W. was secretly filming Arthur without his consent. She shows her father a tape of Arthur and Buster playing catch in the living room. At the same time, the plate was broken. Mr. Reed grounds his son on the spot, even though Arthur swears it wasn't his fault. Mr. Reed gets back to work, while D.W. takes a moment to rub salt in her brother's wounds. Which reminds me, you boys dance divinely. Have fun with your talk tonight. What a bitch. DW makes her grand exit, having nothing else to contribute to the plot. But a lot of you wanted me to cover this episode, so let's press forward. Arthur and Buster set out to prove their innocence and go to Fern's house for detective advice, which feels like something that could have easily been done over the phone. Fern tells him to take a page out of Sherlock Holmes' book, so Arthur goes home to do cocaine. Turns out, DW's tape has also convinced Mrs. Reed that her son is guilty, even though she's the one who put a glass plate near an open windowsill in the first place. The boys take the tape to the brain, who points out the crack in the plate is inconsistent with a type of damage a baseball could do. He also isolates a mysterious sound from the tape using some super high-tech Ultra Pro Tools bullshit that absolutely 100% definitely exists. The boys scour Arthur's living room to find the source of the noise and discover a watch belonging to Miss Persky, who delivered the plate to the house. Miss Persky says she never went inside the house and then jumps on the fuck you Arthur bandwagon. Are you sure you didn't break it? Why does that voice sound familiar? Arthur starts to question his own sanity as everyone is turned against him. The boys go to Fern, who tells them the watch is the only thing that could have broken the plate. Which, again, could have been covered on a phone call. The boys go back to Arthur's house, where they discover the source of the noise is a faulty manhole cover. Arthur starts to put two and two together, and comes up with a plan to prove his innocence. Arthur's house, 6.10 p.m. We're already at the house. We don't need a second title card. Also, why are you saying all the locations out loud? It's not like your audience can't read. Uh, wait, maybe they can't. That evening, Arthur gathers everyone to reveal the truth, but not before D.W. gets in one last dig at her brother. Thank you all for coming. I'm here all the time. Mom. It turns out Miss Persky's watch fell off her wrist after she dropped off the plate. The watch was then propelled by the manhole cover through the window and cracked the plate. Which sounds like the kind of bullshit an actual eight-year-old would make up to save their ass. Mr. Reed apologizes to Arthur, and Miss Persky agrees to replace the plate free of charge. I do so love a good mystery. This is a story of when Caillou went to the park with his grandpa, and he met a boy he didn't like. Or at least, Caillou thought he didn't like him. <laughs> it seems all's well that ends well, except Miss Persky stupidly leaves the new plate next to the window. Let's review. D.W. filmed her brother without his consent and used it to frame him for a crime he didn't commit. She taunted him after getting him grounded and didn't even offer to help prove his innocence. Arthur and Buster ran all over town to help get their proof, leading them down a rabbit hole which ended with a manhole that made Mr. Reed shut his cake hole. And even after Arthur successfully proved his innocence, it didn't mean a damn thing since everyone ended up right back where they started. So, F you, Mr. Reed, for rushing to blame your son. F you, Mrs. Reed, for putting a glass plate next to an open window. F you, Miss Persky, for being the Caillou narrator. And of course, for making the tape that got her brother in trouble in the first place. 
F U D W. And I say, hey. hey, I have a Patreon. Sign up at patreon.com slash Neff to get your name in the thank you credits, along with early access to every FUDW and the chance to vote for future episodes. If there's a movie or show you'd like me to talk about, top tier patrons can commission a review for my channel. Check out the link in the description to become an FUDW superfan. Also, I'm now on Cameo, so make sure to check out my profile to get a personalized FU video. Next time on FUDW... Do you remember the code for our bank account? It's in the book! The book! And I say, hey! What a wonderful kind of day If you could learn to work and play And get along with each other